And it's time for another Gracious Guest Show with me, your host, your humble host, by the way, Mike Creepy, host of the Gracious Guest Program. And um, why we call it the Gracious Guest, it's a long story, but the long story short is that it's like a double meaning, you know, like we're all, you, so I, you're, basically, I'm your gracious guest because I, even though I'm the host, I know this might be confusing, I am now a guest on your device, Okay, so wherever you are, if you're in the grocery store, you're driving or you're listening to this on on, uh, the computer. uh, First of all, thank you, because I mean, (laughs) like, why would you want to listen to me? That's that's always what makes me laugh. But the download uh, count just keeps going up. So that's great. Um, Thanks, mom Uh, and anyone else who might have tuned in. But uh, so in one sense, yes, I'm your gracious guest. But we're also kind of I think, you know, there's this invitation, this opportunity, I should say, for us to all be gracious guests Uh, in this life, to be thankful for, there's so much to be thankful for, but to be thankful for the things around us that sometimes are the very things that that are um, maybe the most important start points, and if nothing else, for us to, to, or springboards into these these greater experiences of meaning in life, Uh, but we oftentimes miss those, or we don't pay attention to them, or or we um, downplay their significance. So, movies, books, travel, um, just, you know, those, those moments we have in relationships, we really have an opportunity to connect with someone else in a real way, not just, you know, through a screen. This is great. I'm talking to you. You can hear me, but this isn't as good, you know, as sitting face to face and having a real conversation. Um, but it's something right. So the, I, I want to kind of think about some of those things on this show. And that's why I do all sorts of random seeming topics with a common theme, wonder, marvel, the experience of, uh, the unknown may be becoming a little bit more known. Um, the connecting points that connect us with all uh, people around the world and, and this common human experience that might lead us to ask some of the bigger questions, you know, even if we don't come to all the answers just now. So uh, anyway, that's that's a little vague but somewhat maybe intriguing breakdown of what some of this show is about. So today I want to talk about kind of three connected things, and that's uh, the, the title I have here, Tolkien enchantment and fairy. All right. So maybe your interest has been piqued here by this. And uh, this is, in a way, it's kind of a, a sneak book review. Usually I say that very explicitly in the title if it's a, if that's really kind of my main goal. But with this, I, I don't know. There's <laughs> We'll see where this episode goes. I'm going to try to keep it relatively brief. Um, so first off, let me just mention that I, um, the book that I'm going to be talking about and I'll have in the show notes uh, for you as well is a, a, a little book. Um, this particular version I have is um, with the appendices. It's a little over 200 pages. A book by the, by the name of um, The Power of the Ring, The Spiritual Vision Behind the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit by Stratford Caldecott. Again, it's uh, The Power of the Ring, The Spiritual Vision Behind Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And Stratford Caldecott uh, died um, just a couple years ago, actually. He was only in his, I think, late 50s. Um, he had um, sort of a undiagnosed cancer of some kind, I'm not sure which, that, that they just didn't catch early enough. And so he died rather quickly, sadly, um, pretty tragic. But he was the director of the Center for Faith and Culture um, in Oxford and um, wrote very extensively. Uh, he was well, very well known in Catholic sort of intellectual circles. He wrote... Uh, uh, lots of different uh, articles and, and commentary on culture and faith and all these different things. And brilliant guy, just very, very erudite, but, you know, just very, uh, um, I think, easy to follow. He's, he's, uh, his, his language is very uh, accessible. Um, and I don't know, I consider myself relatively intelligent, but by the same token, sometimes I'll get knee deep into a book and I'm like, I don't think I'm smart enough to read this book. <laughs> and it's like this embarrassing, like you don't want to tell anybody you know, but you're, you're kind of like, yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes I'll get like a hundred pages into a book and feel like, I don't know. I have no idea what's been going on this whole time. And like, you know, you want to like turn yourself into your teachers or something from, from back when, but anyway, he's not like that, thankfully. Um, and he, he makes you feel smarter. He helps you, you grow in your, your intellectual uh, prowess, I think. So at any rate, uh, he, he focuses on a lot of, um, 
literary themes, cultural things, you know, Catholicism. Um, but he's not specifically like an apologist or, or anything like that. I think he's got a lot that, that uh, even if you're not coming from any kind of religious background, I think you'd find very interesting. This book, especially for a few reasons. First of all, it's pretty short. Uh, it didn't take me too long to read. Although that being said, it's got a lot in it. And it's the kind of book you want to sort of take your time and digest. But uh, I think you could pretty easily get through it in a week or two, um, just kind of picking at it. Um, Peter Kreeft, who's a, I, I'm a huge fan of, he's, he's one of my mentors, uh, professor of um, religious uh, or philosophy of religion at Boston College. Uh, I got this recommendation from him through a lecture. He, he said that uh, this and Tom Shippey's book, Author of the Century, about Tolkien, which I reviewed a, a while back on this program, he said those two, in his opinion, were the best two books out there uh, sort of together about uh, Tolkien and the process of writing The Lord of the Rings, the meaning of it, the impact of it, uh, and the spiritual vision, which is really what Caldecott takes up in this book. So that's why I finally got around to it recently. And uh, Kreeft says, uh, this is on the back of the, the book itself, he says, If anyone asks me what one book about Tolkien is the most worth reading, The Power of the Ring is my reply. So that's a pretty hefty endorsement from Dr. Kreeft, who himself is, is no slouch when it comes to, to Tolkien. So I, I picked this up. I, I uh, uh, was very excited to, uh, to finally get around to it. And uh, so he goes through a ton of stuff. Let me just share with you very, very quickly. I don't like to read ad nauseum from books, but this is sort of his thesis paragraph, I think, and it's early on. Um, he says, I don't want to make too much of this, but the letter is revealing. He's talking about one of Tolkien's letters he had just quoted. Uh, he says, Tolkien seems to have felt that it had been given to him to sound the horn of hope in a darkling world. And those many thousands of readers who return again and again to the book and film for refreshment of soul might well agree with him. This is a story that tells us things we need to know. It cannot be taken in all at once. It is one of those that we have to grow into. Stories that deal with the way the world is made and the way the self is made. These stories are like dreams, but dreams that can be shared by an entire culture. Wholesome dreams that restore a balance to the psyche by turning our energies and our thoughts toward truth. Dreams that resemble an oasis in the desert. Reading them can be a meditation. Why is that? This is the question I want to answer. Uh, and he does, I, I think. I think he makes a pretty compelling case. But he's again, he's looking at, it's, it's partly biographical, but it's mostly about the the overall sort of experience of Tolkien and what he was trying to communicate through The Lord of the Rings, through The Hobbit, through The Silmarillion, which was published uh, posthumously by his, his son, kind of pulling together his notes. And, and um, so if you're not familiar with that, you know, basically J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, he was born in the late 1800s in, in um, actually, I think he was born in South Africa. I'm kind of doing this from memory now. He spent a few years in South Africa, his brother and, and his mom, his father died tragically. They moved back to England and then his mother died when he was still a boy. And he and his brother became the wards of a, a tremendously holy and wise uh, priest who, in a sense, you can see some seeds of Gandalf uh, kind of in, in that priest and his wisdom and his interaction with, uh, with Tolkien and his brother. And uh, Tolkien himself, uh, really from, from a young age, when he was in World War I at, at least, you know, if not earlier and, and probably a little bit earlier, he started really kind of writing down some of these ideas and developing this, this vision for this this mythos uh, that would eventually become most popularly, you know, The Hobbit first, um, which was more of a kid's book, set in that world, which didn't or originally, that wasn't really his intention originally, it just kind of worked out. And then that led into the sequel with The Lord of the Rings, which was also set in that mythos and that, that vision. But the vision itself is so much bigger than what most people even realize. Uh, certainly myself, you know, growing up, I didn't really know much more about Lord of the Rings than like when the movies came out. And uh, so he talks about the movies. He talks about a lot of different things um, in this book. But the, the two I just want to focus on, actually, because there's way too much. You know, first of all, go read the book. It's just a great book. That's my review. <laughs> but kind of broader here, I wanted to uh, focus on this idea of, of uh, enchantment and fairy and um, the way fairy I have spelled here, it's on purpose, it's, you know, F-A-E-R-I-E, -E, uh, was a term really, you know, Tolkien kind of uses this specifically in his, his uh, essay, famous essay, you can get it online for free, it doesn't take too long to read, uh, Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. 
uh, where he it's, it's more academic, but he explores a lot of different themes of the fairy realm um, and, uh, and, and this sort of realm of, you know, magic and the, the, the possible and our, our dreams and wonder and marvel. And again, all those things I love to, to sort of explore. Um, but along those same lines, what's neat is Caldecott in this book, he's talking about, um, when the, um, the hobbits or when the, the fellowship in Lord of the Rings first gets to, um, into Lothlorien and, and they're with the, the elves after Gandalf has died and they're in spoiler alert, sorry. When they're in this this enchanted forest with the wood elves, and he's talking about this idea of of enchantment, and he points out that the word I never thought of this before, but the word enchantment literally has the sense of being in a song, almost like swimming in it, you know, like you think chant, right? Chant is in there and singing, like to chant a song. So enchantment, like in songment, and I was like, that's that's cool. <laughs> understatement of the year. Think about that for a sec. You know how, um, if you've ever seen the movie Lord of the Rings, there's like this really airy kind of like ethereal sort of music always going on, like in the background, uh, in, in the, this sort of enchanted woodland. And, you know, that's a theme, right, that comes up in a lot of stories, kids' books and fairy tales when you were a kid. You know, there's always like the enchanted wood and, and something about woods and some of these natural locations that have in these stories, that kind of, you know, air of the other, otherworldly, you know, sometimes it's superstitious, or not superstitious, supernatural, rather. Um, we see it in science fiction as well, uh, but but that can kind of take on a different sort of approach. So if you just think of, like, you know, the stories you loved when you were a kid, or when you would, not just stories, <laughs> this, is, this is, I think, my big point, we've been there. I don't know about you. Sometimes, you know, you're out in, in the forest or you're somewhere and you just feel different. Like there's some, like you feel like tapped into some kind of energy or you're like, there's something going on right now. Like I, or, or, you know, this can be creepy sometimes. Right. And there, there I, you know, we could get into a theological discussion of some of the very real negative, you know, side of this that there could be, cause it's not all spiritual forces are good folks. A little hint. Um, but, you know, it seems like there are sometimes just some places or some experiences where I just kind of, I can't put it into words, but I know there's something else. I'm not just here. I'm somewhere else too. That's why I think, you know, when we feel something like that happening in a story, you kind of like drop everything else, right? You really, even if you've been kind of slogging along through a book or a movie and you're, you get to that one scene and you're like, Oh wow. Okay. This is neat. Like there's something just, you know, that wow factor hits you, your jaw drops or, or sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's just like you feel that enchantment. Like I'm swimming in a song. There's, there's music to this place. There's like, um, I can almost, there's like a harmony, you know, or, I'm I'm almost like um, in this this sort of uh, experience I can't quite put into words that feels like I'm almost like in a song. So anyway, I don't know that maybe I'm crazy. I just kind of thought that was pretty neat. The idea of of being inside a song, uh, this place, this experience of wonder, where we start to recover, even if just for a minute, that sense of what if. You know what what if, what if it isn't all just in my science textbook as wonderful and as awesome as science is at being able to incredibly explain all the details of, of a lot of our common experiences. But we're foolish, quite frankly. We're really foolish. We're really blind. We're, we're more foolish than little children who know better when we think that's it or we believe the lie that, like, everything can just be explained in purely scientific terms. Um, that claim itself can't be proven in science, you know, through the scientific method, right? Think about that. The claim that every, like all knowledge and all human experience and all experience in the universe can somehow be explained scientifically is absolutely impossible to prove scientifically. So it, it's just a foolish thing to even say. Um, so just, and, and we know better, honestly. <laughs> like that's what always is funny to me about that whole argument. I think every one of us knows better. We, you know, we like to kid ourselves um, because I think we, we sometimes we get scared. We don't really know. When we're in those moments of encounter with wonder, with marvel, with the the what if, it can be scary. And that's fair. Like, just admit it, right? It can scare the crap out of you. Because maybe 
you don't have all the answers. Maybe there's more here than meets the eye. Maybe there's more, you know, about myself even that I don't fully understand. Well, that's, of course, that's scary, right? That's scary for all of us. Um, but, you know, we're never going to really be able to grow and live the full human experience if we just shut that off and just be like, well, you know, nothing to see here. There, there might be a lot to see there and you're, you're not allowing yourself to see it. So here, just, and, and this is the idea, again, the realm of the fairy realm, you know, um, this is what Viggo Mortensen, who played Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings, was talking about when they asked him, you know, why do these, you know, they were making the movies, they're doing the big promo. Like, why does Lord of the Rings appeal to so many people? Why does it keep turning up at the top of the list? You know, when, when audiences are polled, you know, what was the greatest book of the 20th century? Poll after poll after poll comes back with people, you know, saying it's Lord of the Rings. They People love it. And why? Why do they keep rereading it? Why are the movies so popular? Um, Viggo Mortensen, I think he's he's got his finger on the balls. He just said unabashedly uh, and very seriously, he said, because it's a true story. And, you know, I can, you know, and I think some people reading that or he's seeing that interview were like, wait, what, you know, are you out of your mind? You think there's like fairies and hobbits and stuff running around? Well, first off, hey, maybe, maybe there are. I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you think there are fairies and elves and hobbits? We don't have any proof of them. Well, okay. Um, good luck with that life. That sounds pretty boring to me. I personally like to have a little bit of like, what if, you know, uh, I don't rule out aliens, extraterrestrial civilizations. Cause I don't know. Maybe there are, that sounds pretty awesome to me. You know, um, doesn't mean I'm going to sit outside all day with binoculars looking for them. That might be a little excessive, but Hey, be a kid again, a little bit, you know, get over yourself, <laughs> let yourself have a little fun. Let yourself have a little wonder, a little joy, uh, turn off the news. You know, what, what are you getting out of it anyway? You know, just misery. Why don't, why don't, you know, we all spend a little more time trying to let a little more joy into the world. And then that will start to affect those headlines we see, but we have to start with ourselves. So that's where I think fairy, the realm of the fairy realm, uh, enchantment, uh, letting yourself journey into that experience, um, and to sort of let your imagination run wild a little bit every now and then is, is a really rewarding experience, you know. Um, and basically, you know, I, I think this really, in my opinion, um, is, I think Tolkien did exactly what he wanted to do. Even if he didn't do it the way he wanted to in every single sense, or he didn't get everything he wanted written down, you know, who, who can? Um, Tolkien said that he wanted to baptize the imagination, uh, as a very devout Catholic himself, you know, a daily mass goer most of his life, uh, he was one who truly, deeply loved Jesus Christ and his church. Uh, he wasn't naive to the problems that arise in the church from time to time, of course, and that now everyone in the church, even leaders in the church, are, you know, sinful human beings in need of grace, just like anybody else. But Tolkien loved Christ, he loved the church. Uh, and he wanted, he was very serious about this his whole life. He was absolutely opposed to anyone uh, painting his work as an allegory. He didn't really like allegory. He thought it had its uses. Uh, but the idea of a one-for-one -one swap, like Gandalf is, you know, Samuel the prophet, and, you know, Frodo is Jesus, and Sam is, you know, St. Peter. And Well, you know, yeah, but also no. <laughs> You know, because it's it's not as easy as that. Um, the idea here is that um, it's it's a whole world. It's a, it's supposed to be the real world a very long time ago. This world, you know, uh, open to possibilities way beyond where we normally sort of draw the line. Um, so for that, I mean, for that matter, I always tell people that you know, ever since I finally got around to reading Lord of the Rings and starting to develop and discover this passion for it and interest in it, I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of it. I've read um, The Hobbit all, and all of Lord of the Rings. I've seen the movies a million times. I've read now, I don't know, six or seven different you know books on Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. I have the Silmarillion I'm working my way through. Um, I feel like I'll be a beginner for my whole life uh, on the whole thing because it's... Uh, I think uniquely in terms of, of things I've read, you know, unique in the sense that it does such a tremendous job of drawing you into a real story that's just great in and of itself. And the whole time it's doing it, it's it's sort of, 
you know, hitting certain little chords that way down deep in you that you didn't even know were there, I think, <laughs> you know, and, and that are true um, and that are meaningful um, places of, of sort of uh, meditation and consideration um, that, that really can translate into your own life. You know, the, the big questions and how you treat other people and what things you value and uh, what things you will stake your life on. All of those kinds of things, I think, are, are taken up in a tremendous way in Lord of the Rings, really an unparalleled way. So, again, I, I recommend, of course, anything Tolkien wrote, go to the source early and often um, and, and really, you know, dig through those. Take your time. Don't try to rush through it. Don't try to make it a just a check-the-block thing, but... Um, Explore it and, and be ready to go back and explore it again. And definitely get your hands on The Power of the Ring. It was originally published under the title Secret Fire. I kind of think they should have kept that title personally. but um, So uh, The Secret Fire, which is you know Gandalf references uh, when he's uh, standing up against the Balrog down in uh, the Mines of Moria. And they still have that line in the movie, too, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, that, that was the original title. And then it was republished um, through uh, Crossroad. And uh, so the original title, again, was Secret Fire. I think that came out in like 2001 or two, uh, or two, 2003. This one that you can get on uh, Amazon, just look up uh, Power of the Ring Caldecott, C-A-L-D-E-C-O-T-T, -T, Stratford Caldecott, and uh, it was written in 2012, was his updated version. So, uh, and, uh, and I think he died later that year, actually, so it was right at the end of his life, and it's, it's a, a real... Uh, just, you know, excellent effort on his part, you know, and and, uh, and really useful, I think, in, in trying to better understand Tolkien in, in his whole Lord of the Rings world, um, in the world of The Hobbit and the Silmarillion. So that's going to do it for this episode of The Gracious Guest Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, if Without you, this is just me sitting in front of a microphone, which I guess is kind of fun, but kind of pointless um, by the same token. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Hope this is useful. Please do me a favor. Uh, really, you know, uh, hit me up on uh, email. Uh, go to the website, thegraciousguest.org. That's my website. Uh, you can email me at uh, thegraciousguest at gmail.com, or you can just send me a message right through the website. There's a little uh, form there on the main page, the splash page. Check out blog posts over there and uh, presentations I can come give for your event. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for now. Also, subscribe to the podcast, actually, if you haven't done that already. And please tell your friends. I want to really try to get those numbers going up. Um, if you like the program also and you haven't done so already, please give me a, uh, a good review over there on iTunes. That helps get the word spread about the show as well. It only takes a couple minutes. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in to The Gracious Guest Show. I'm your host, Mike Creevy. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care.